So I'm going to go live on Facebook at the same time. Hey. This is the fun little game of, is it going to work or is it not going to work? Okay. So that's really great. Hello, my name is Kaylee. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming to our program tonight. It is a joint program between the Guildford Library and the Thompson Institute Historical Society. And tonight, this is the History of the New Hampshire Primary with John Graffair. Graffair. Okay, that would not have been what I would have said. Um, we are very happy to have him here tonight, and we're very happy to have you guys here in person and people here online as well. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can just you know hold on to them until the end. Um, no. Oh, no, or no, no, I'll take them now. Let's just kidding. If you have questions, just shout them out. Yes. Um, and yeah, thank you guys all so much for coming. I'm gonna turn your dials at the end of the program. You can hand them off to me. Let's get started with the program. <laughs> That's me. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can I take my mask off so I can hear me a little better? Yes. Um, so maybe the first question you ask is, who the heck am I? Why am I doing this? Um, so I'm a, uh, I have a video production company down in Concord and do documentary production. And about 30 years ago, I hate to say it, but it's about actually more than 30 years ago, um, a friend of mine down in Concord, Chuck Burton, Charles Burton, who's written a couple of books on the history of the primary contacted me about doing a documentary history of the New Hampshire primary. And at that point in time, his actually his book hadn't been finished. It was only in manuscript form. And so I used his book as the basis of research, and he was my historical kind of uh, guide. And we produced a two-hour history of the primary from its beginning until 1984, because we were in 86 when we did this. And then um, in 2000, we were contacted uh, by the New Hampshire Political Library, Bill Gardner and Hugh Gray, and they thought maybe we should do an extension. And so we did a, an update of the primary for the next four years. So that covered it up to 2000. And so that, 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 those documentaries are really the basis of what this presentation is. Now we're not gonna watch the documentary, we're gonna see clips from the documentary. So that having been said, um, that right there is a, uh, Chuck was an obsessive guy, an obsessive guy. He died four years ago, but he literally had every magazine cover that was published about the New Hampshire primary. And this is the first, Newsweek, 1952 in January. Um, and it's interesting to note for what it's showing. It's not showing a candidate, it's showing the farmers of New Hampshire up in front of the dairy barn. Um, but before we get to that, Let's talk a little bit about why we even have a primary and how it got started. So primary elections really had their start back in the very early part of the 20th century. And there were an outgrowth of the progressive era, the progressive movement. And in fact, the very first primary, presidential primary, was held in Wisconsin, which was the home state of Robert Rafala, who was one of the leaders of the progressive movement. I mean, it was a way of saying, you know, these elections, be it state or federal, you know, they're decided in back rooms by a bunch of guys smoking cigars. And we feel we need to put it in the hands of the people. And so primaries were created to decide for each party, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the Independent Party, whatever, um, so that they would vote by ballot so that anybody who was a member of that party could have a say in who the presidential candidates were. So that was the basis. And the very first presidential primary in Wisconsin was held in 1912. Um, okay. Yeah, 19, no, I'm sorry. The first president was in 1905 when it was created. So it would have been in 1908 when they had the first presidential primary. But by 1912, 12 states had now adopted presidential primaries. New Hampshire did not adopt a presidential primary. Um, but in 2012, um, the Progressive Party started to gain some momentum here in New Hampshire. Now I'm going to ask, I'd like to throw out these little questions here from the Historical Society. We're going to test your historical <laughs> trivia knowledge about New Hampshire because there's a lot of trivia that I can throw at you. Um, you want to take a guess on who the two leaders of the Progressive Party were in New Hampshire. And you're going to throw out some names. 
All right, seeing lots of heads. Um, turning, no. The first one was Robert P. Bass. And Robert P. Bass was the father of Perkins Bass, who was the father of Charlie Bass, who was, uh, until Annie Custer beat him a, couple, a few years ago, our congressman. So Robert Bass was uh, elected governor of New Hampshire in 2012. 1912. 1912, you're right, thanks. I gotta keep story. And I haven't done this talk in seven months, so I might be a little rusty, but I'll get it all out. Um, the other leader was Winston Churchill. Now, when I say Winston Churchill, who am I talking about? Good Not the Churchill from Great Britain, Good the way. Churchill from New Hampshire. Winston Churchill was lived in Cornish, New Hampshire. He was a very progressive um, um, politician and um, wrote, was a, one of the most popular writers in America at the turn of the century. And one of his most popular books was a book called Coniston, which was all about New Hampshire politics. Coniston was a pseudonym for Croydon, and it was based around a political boss, railroad boss in New Hampshire by the name of Ruel Durkee, um, who actually existed. And there was lots of controversy about this, but nevertheless, um, that's Winston Churchill. Now, on a side about Winston Churchill that I always like to share is that it was also about the early 1900s that the Winston Churchill in England started to gain little fame himself. And he would get New Hampshire Winston Churchill's fan mail sometimes. Well, when Winston Churchill in England wrote his first book, the publisher here in New Hampshire, or in, in New York, who contacted the publisher of for Winston Churchill from, Con uh, from uh, Cornish, and said, that, let's do a joint book tour with the two of Winston Churchill's. We'll do a joint book tour around the country, and they need to promote the books. The Winston Churchill in New Hampshire said, I'm not going to waste my time with some loser guy from England who I don't know anything about, and turned the idea down. Now, the sad part about Winston Churchill was that he died in 1947, still living in Cornish, which means he lived long enough to see his fame obliterated by the other Winston Churchill. Very interesting story. Anyway, so they, uh, they, they so the progressives kind of elected in 1912. Uh, he, actually, it wasn't the formal progressive party. He was a Republican. Robert Bass was a Republican. And they passed the primary bill for the state of New Hampshire for state elections, but they did not pass one for presidential elections. The next year, um, actually Bass was elected, and forgive me because it's been a few years, a few months. Bass was elected in 1910. 1912, in the presidential race, um, we had a split within the Republican Party nationally because Theodore Roosevelt decided he was going to come back and run for president, and they created the Bull Moose Party, and this created a split which allowed the Democrats to get elected as president, and that's why Woodrow Wilson became president, and the same thing happened here in New Hampshire. The Republican Party split, and a Democrat was elected, Samuel Falker, to be governor of New Hampshire in 1912. And the Democrats had the majority, and they passed the law to create a presidential primary for the state of New Hampshire. So I always like to throw out how many birthdays does the New Hampshire primary have. It's actually got four. Number one is when it was passed to create the New Hampshire primary in 1913. And that date was set to be the third Tuesday of May. However, before, and then the next presidential election was going to be in 1916. Before that date came around, um, New Hampshire and Yankee thrift started to kick in. And they realized, well, then we could have two elections. What if we do it on town meeting day? Um, then we could just have one election and save us the cost of that second election. So the legislature changed the primary bill to have the election on March 13th or whatever the date was, the second Tuesday in March, prime uh, town meeting day. So in 1916, we had the first New Hampshire presidential primary. Uh, it was a week after Indiana had its primary, and a week after, uh, I'm look at my notes here, I hate to do that, but I do. So, uh, 1913 legislature primary held one week after Indiana, and the same day as Minnesota. Okay, so we weren't first in 1916. Indiana had the first primary. But in the intervening next four years, Indiana decided to move its primary to January. And with Minnesota switched from a primary election to a caucus system. So suddenly, because Indiana gave it up and because Minnesota changed, New Hampshire became the first 
in the presidential primary. And there you have the third birthday for the New Hampshire primary being 1920, when we were the first in the nation presidential primary. So this year was the 100th anniversary of us being the first in the nation presidential primary. Now, let's take a look here. Let's see if this is, yeah, go back. There's a ballot from the very first New Hampshire presidential primary. Now, there's some things that are different. A little different. I'm just going to bring that so you can read it a little bit. First of all, it's a Republican ballot. The Republicans were blue and the Democrats were red in 1920. Second of all, I don't know if you can read the names on there. Are you able to read the names? Yeah. Okay. What don't you see? You don't see Warren G. Harding. You don't see any presidential candidate's name on there. The primary did not have presidential. You didn't vote for a presidential candidate. You voted for delegates to go to the national convention, some committed and some not. So if you look closer, you'll see John H. Bartlett pledged to vote for Leonard Wood for president. So some candidates went as pledged, some candidates didn't. Some candidates, you know, were you a small state in New Hampshire and you knew, oh yeah, um, uh, Toby, he's gonna be, a, he'll, he'll be a Harley supporter. So, so it was indirect, but nobody, none of these votes were cast for a presidential primary. They were cast for individuals to be delegates to the convention. Now, just again, throwing my little trivia at you. Recognize any names on there? John Winnett. John Winan, good one. How many people know John Winan? Good. I'm from Concord. Pardon? I'm from Concord. Oh, you are. So you know that we have the new John Winan statue now in front of the state, uh, in the state library. Um, does, does everybody know who John Winan is? So I don't need to explain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other names on there? You should recognize. Toby. Toby, good one. No, you know, New Hampshire history. Charles Toby, for those that don't, I'll just throw out. Uh, at this point in time, this is 1920, so he hadn't really been elected to office, but Charles Toby ultimately was elected to be a congressman for the second congressional district, went on to serve as governor, and also was elected to the United States Senate. The only other person in the 20th century besides Judd Gray to hold all three offices in his lifetime. Um, any others? Maybe if you reckon the others, you can start surprising me because I can't tell you the others are, except for one. Down here in the very lower left, Frank Knox. Does that like, now anybody recognize Frank Knox? Because of all of them, Frank Knox is probably the one that left the most influence here in New Hampshire. So let me explain Frank Knox. Frank Knox was a rough rider with Teddy Roosevelt. And he came to New Hampshire in 1912 to start a newspaper with the express purpose of promoting the Bull Moose Party and Theodore Roosevelt's election to president. And that newspaper was the Manchester Evening Leader. He was very successful. And the other paper in New Hampshire and Manchester was called the Manchester Morning Union. And he, after nine months of the, union, the Evening Leader, the people at the Morning Union said, this isn't cut it, let's do cut a deal and we'll, we'll merge. And so the two papers merged, and that's where the New Hampshire Union, Manchester Union leader came from. Combination of the evening leader and the morning union. Um, Knox then went on to, while still owning the union leader, uh, went on to manage the Hearst chain of newspapers. So he managed William Randolph Hearst newspapers. And then he got tired of that, and he came back, and he tried to run for governor of New Hampshire unsuccessfully. He was the vice presidential candidate with Alf Landon in 1936. And in 1940, Franklin Roosevelt um, brought him in, even though he's a Republican, brought him in to be the um, Secretary of the Navy. So Frank Knox was the Secretary of the Navy in the very early years of World War II, and he died in 1944, still owning the Union leader. And when he died, his wife took over ownership, and she really wanted nothing to do with the newspaper and she sold it to William Bowe. So those are some of the connections. Anyway, let's get back to the primary. Enough with my diversionary tactics. I'm gonna just shut this down. Um, just make this full screen. So what happens? We got a primary that doesn't have presidential candidates. It's just got that. And that went on until 1948. And after the 1948 election, 
in part because of prodding from this new owner of the union leader, people started saying, what is this meaningless exercise? Why don't we vote for candidates? Why don't we vote for candidates? And so this discussion started in New Hampshire to maybe change, make some either stop doing it or make some changes so that it becomes more interesting. And that's where a man named Richard Upton comes into play. Uh, if you're from Concord, you might know the name Upton. Anybody else recognize the name Upton? Upton Sanderson Smith is a law firm that's uh, right behind St. Paul's Church in Concord, still there, the same office that Richard used to, Richard Upton used to practice in. Richard's father was very involved in politics. And Richard in 1948 ran for the state house, and he was what was termed, as he put it, a comer. And ultimately he was elected Speaker of the House. And we're not going to meet Richard Upton. We're going to play our first video of what you have to come up here and push my buttons. I'm sorry. It just came up. All right. So and this is the story of how Upton what what, what Upton did. I'm gonna make you the host real quick. Tell me when I can go back. And then okay, so take off down the road with Richard up. I'll put my next stuff down. So uh, in the nineteen forty nine legislature when I was elected speaker, fortunately, um I saw through it that a bill was introduced. I didn't at that time feel that the speaker should introduce a bill under his own name. So I had a friend of mine, uh, Reuben Moore, back to sponsor the bill. He agreed with me about it. And I wrote the bills out on one weekend, some of it on the back of an envelope. Richard Upton's bill did essentially two things. First, it put the names of presidential candidates on the ballot in a preference poll or beauty contest. Secondly, it allowed for the inclusion of a candidate's name on the ballot by petition with 100 signatures, unless a candidate specifically asked not to be on the ballot. I guess the idea is to force the presidential candidates into the field, whether they want to or not. The bill passed both houses of the legislature with voice votes and full support of both Democratic and Republican leadership. On May 11, 1949, Governor Sherman Adams signed the bill for the presidential preference primary. He wasn't too sure. Uh, that uh, he wants to sign it. I, uh, I went in and called me in and said, what does this bill mean? And uh, we went, uh, went over the possible consequences. I think we discussed uh, how it might impact on uh, various upcoming candidates. Um, I gave it as my opinion that um, it would quicken the interest of the voters that there would be a real, I hope, I hope a real lively contest and that our state would be put on the map. All right, so there's Richard Upton. Um, hoped it might put our state on the map. So let's first of all understand what the bill did. It put the names, it did three things. It put the names of presidential candidates on the ballot. It allowed for those presidential candidates to have their name taken off the ballot if they didn't want to be on it. And the third thing I can't remember. <laughs> but those are the those are the two primary ones. So, but the names are only on. The, did you turn it up? It's going to be real loud. It's going to be real loud. So we're going to have to adjust it after we go to the next clip. But there was no connection between the presidential candidates and the names of the delegates. The names of the delegates were still on the ballot, and so were the names of the presidential candidates. But there was no connection. If, if, if Eisenhower won all the ballots, but everybody voted for the delegates to Taft, Taft would have got all the delegates. It was not connected. There was absolutely zero connection. It was just a beauty contest. You hear the term beauty contest. This was a beauty contest in the true sense of the words. If your vote for president meant nothing other than to say you'd like that guy had no connection. So that was pretty important. So now let's take a look at the political landscape in 1952. Um, most important thing to Republicans, who wants to take a guess? Eisenhower to win? Before that. Before you get to that, you have to have something else going on. Four years 
where four presidential elections in a row had been won by Democrats. Actually, five. Roosevelt four times and Truman once. Five presidential elections had been won by Democrats. So the Republicans have been kept out of the White House for a long time, and they were aching, and they were priority was to get something going. So the two primary candidates on the Republican side um, were Eisenhower and Robert Taft. Now, Robert Taft was the known as Mr. Republican, Senator from Ohio, the son of, of Taft, the president, um, almost heir apparent, you know, heir apparent, very conservative Republican, though. Eisenhower wasn't even interested in running for president. He was a commander of NATO in 1952. He was stationed in Europe, and he would not, he did not want to enter, the, he didn't enter the presidential race. Didn't. But the key to the New Hampshire primary was, was back in that thing is you could put the candidate's name on the ballot, but the candidate didn't have to put his name on the ballot. A delegate could. The candidate, if the candidate wanted to take action, he could ask to have his name taken off the ballot. But anybody could put his name on the ballot. So the people that were supporting Eisenhower could just go and put his name in. Eisenhower could just sit back. I'm not going to play politics. Even to the point, I'm not even going to ask him to take my name off the ballot. If they want to do it, that's fine. I'm over here. I'm a military guy. I'm a hero from World War II. I'm taking care of NATO. I don't need to play those dirty political games. So it, made it, it was perfect setup for Eisenhower to be in. And after you see Eisenhower was a winnable candidate. You know, let's face it, in 1952, there was probably, he was the greatest hero in America, and if not the world. Um, so the leaders of the Eisenhower movement in New Hampshire were Sherman Adams, who was the governor at the time, and, and also um, Richard Upton was in there. Um, and they would go on and they would do these forums with stand-ins and they would have the debate, the guy standing in for Taft, the guy standing in for Eisenhower, and they have debates. And oftentimes Adams, Sherman Adams would be the one who was the Eisenhower guy. And that was how they ran the campaign. So now let's look over at the Democratic side. Harry Truman was president. He did not say he was not going to run for president again in 1952, but people sort of thought that maybe he wouldn't. So there was a senator from the state of Tennessee by the name of Estes Kefauver, and Estes Kefauver thought that Eisen or thought that Truman was not going to run, and so he wanted to set himself up to try to kind of okay if, when Truman takes himself out, he wanted to be in a good position to have people look and say, all right, Kefauver is the one we want to go with this time around. So he decided the way to do that. He looked at New Hampshire and he said, I think I'm going to go up to New Hampshire and try this thing out. Now, Keith Offer, in terms of the history of the New Hampshire presidential primary, is one of the most important candidates we've ever had. The style that he set is the way the primary runs to this day. Now, I told you it's been a while since I talked this talk, a couple of things that I forgot. Backing up to the creation of the primary, did you notice the names of the people that signed the bill that created the New Hampshire presidential primary? One of them, well, obviously one of them was Sherman Adams, the governor. The second one was Richard Upton, who was the Speaker of the House at the time. The third one was Robert Bass, I'm sorry, uh, Perkins Bass, who at the time was Speaker of the Senate. The political connections are fascinating if you think about it. So his father uh, was governor, and then he signed the bill that created the New Hampshire primary. Um, so with that said, we're not going to, this, this next section is about the Democratic Party primary, not the Republican primary. Um, I will share with you that the Republican primary, what happened was obviously Eisenhower never came to campaign in New Hampshire. Um, Taft finally did come up to campaign and he wasn't the only candidate. You had Harold Stassen was in here from, from Minnesota. It was his, actually his second run for uh, president. And Taft made a sweep around New Hampshire. I, I forget how many days, two or three days, he went up as far as Colebrook and came back down. But Taft was a very old style politician, and he didn't really like to be associating with the lower voting class. And he turned off more voters than he won. Every place he went, he just he wasn't interested in shaking hands. There was a classic, classic picture of him in, in Peterborough when somebody handed him a rooster. And he's holding this rooster with this look on his face. What the? 
that business all about? You know, I don't want to home a rooster around the president about to be elected president. You know, so tax attitude really did not do him well. Um, and in the end, Eisenhower won the New Hampshire presidential primary in 1952. But we're going to focus on the Democratic side. And again, the campaign is you've got Truman. Yeah, he wasn't running, but he had a campaign. There were people here campaigning. Truman never came to New Hampshire to campaign, but Keith Offer did. So, do I need to talk to you? Did, you you, just you should be okay. Yeah. Play and see, and it's going to come out loud. Should I compare? It might this? be okay. I, I couldn't find any Democrats. And there was a little general store there, and the man kicked me out of the store when he heard Keith Offer we don't have any Democrats, and we don't allow them to stay here very long. Yet. In 1952, New Hampshire Democrats were at best fragmented, and worst, a token opposition party. And some believe it was even run by Republicans. They hadn't held a major statewide office in over 15 years, but the primary would open state Democrats to a new world of politics, and it would be a Democratic candidate who sparked the style of campaigning that has become the mark of the New Hampshire primary. What did the man say? I'm going to pause for a second. The guy right in the front there, the guy with the glasses, okay, then you've got the next guy next to him, he's got the frame glasses, and then there's the guy with the white hair, that's Charles Tobin. He thanked me, that was about all. How long were you there? About more than 10 minutes. As chairman of the Senate Special Committee to investigate interstate crime, Tennessee Senator Estes Kefauver became the nation's first political television star. The investigation marked the first live national television coverage of a congressional hearing. And Americans from California to New Hampshire were tuning in. Believing that Harry Truman would not seek another term in office, Kefauver wanted to establish himself as a viable Democratic candidate for president. And he looked to the New Hampshire primary as the vehicle to do it. Well, I was sitting quietly in the office one day and minding my own business, and a very strong conservative in the corner called me up and says, Tom, he said, you know, Mrs. Keefon is coming up here to the tavern to campaign next Sunday? I said, no. Well, he says, I think it's your duty as former Democratic mayor to go down and meet him. Well, I said, well, all right, maybe I should. So Merle and I went down. Keefon was the first Democratic senator that many in New Hampshire had ever seen. He was an anomaly. Democrat who thought himself a winner. Though many owed their loyalties to the president, Kefauver quickly gained supporters, especially among women, many of whom had seen him on television during his committee hearings. We all stood around a little nut. Hugh Bounds was there, Bernie Bootin was there, I was there, and uh, so was Merkel. And uh, what happened was that uh, he said, well, now, Tom, you better help me be my chairman. I said, I can't be your chairman. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the county chairman. He looked around at Huey Bounds and said, Hugh, you going to help me? And I said, Hugh, you can't help him. You're the city chairman. By that time, all of a sudden, there's this little voice from the back of the, of the, of the group. It says, Senator, I'll help you with Mrs. Mack. <laughs> he said, Madam Chen. <laughs> he got this little boy hurt look, honestly. Everybody was turning him down. And I thought, gee, this man comes, he's, uh, he's a senator, nobody will help him, they're crazy. I said, Senator, I'll help you. It was just on impulse. Because the fact was, I was a registered Republican. Peabauer brought a new style of campaigning to New Hampshire. It was personal, sometimes gimmicky. The voters liked it, and it made good copy for the national press covering the primary. You know, he'd just go up the street with his big hand, and he was, he was a big man. And you know, just very casually, well, my name's Estes Kefauver, I'd like your help, and move right on. And they had a system that was, the, the, the Washington staff behind them was a gal getting your name, and then one letter. We've never seen anything like this. And Estes would put on any kind of a hat. I'm not sure that was the best thing in the world, but he would. And he would, he got into everything there was. There was a, if we had a toboggan, he would ride in the toboggan. If there was an ice skater or something, he'd try to skate with him. And, uh, Every kind of a gadget. We found an old fire truck, I think it was, <clears throat> down in uh, in Hooksa. And that was all rigged up with lights. And we run it up and down the street in Manchester at night, and Esther was along there, tailing along with him, shaking hands with everybody that he could find. Once he started it, everyone had to do it. And people expected to be courted in that way. The In the old times, <clears throat> if you wanted to carry a community, you went to see five or six or four or five of the leaders, and sometimes fewer number and 
If you could sell yourself to them, they would get off the boat in the town for you. For you. But uh, that isn't true anymore. So when you think of Lester Kefauver, he was the guy that set it in motion. He was the guy that created this idea that you, you go out and meet people, you shake hands, and you get in the toboggan, you get in the snowmobile, you, you get in the fire truck. And he made it very personal, a way that had never been done. And we here in New Hampshire welcome that. And it made an impression. And, and what happened was Truman won, I'm sorry, Kefauver won the primary. He did not expect to win. He didn't come here to win, but he won. And it embarrassed President Truman, President Truman. And two weeks later, Truman announced that he was not going to run. Now, was Truman not going to run really? We'll never really know. But, and I, I, from my sense is that he wasn't going to run. But it, he no longer, he lost the option of saying I'm not going to run because it was forever going to be looked at because he lost this brand new presidential election up in New Hampshire. Any questions? Quiz me, come on, stump me. Something, no? Was it Keith Lover who had the, showed the famous picture of the hole in his shoe? I'm trying to remember. I think, I think that's Nixon. I think that was Nixon. Or it might have been one of the Democrats in 78. Oh, Stevenson. Oh, okay. Thank Stevenson you. did not come here to campaign. And Stevenson was actually the ultimate nominee on the Democratic Party. It was very, very bitter. Very bitter. They hated the party establishment, hated Estes Keith Lover for as. McIntyre pointed out, he said, they didn't like him much for, for, for putting it up to the old man. And Truman was the old man. So just as an aside, um, again, I did all the interviews for this documentary. And when we went to interview Tom McIntyre, that was who we went to interview, Tom McIntyre. And as we were setting up, it became Myrtle was just hanging around. And I had never, I'd met I'd met, I'd, met, I'd met them both before, so they weren't strangers to me, but, you know, those my little friends. And um, Myrtle was just kind of hanging around. And so at the last minute, I said, oh, Myrtle, would you like to sit in on the interview too? Boom, she was there. And she, the two of them, the dynamic between the two of them was just a, a magic. It was almost a, an hour and a half interview between the two of them, uh, with the two of them that, that uh, we did. And I'm sure you all know, because he was from up here, originally he was from Laconia, the mayor of Laconia. Right. Anyway, so to close out 52, what happened? How come New Hampshire became this thing? Because it really did start. That's the fourth birthday of New Hampshire primary, is the primary of 1952. That was when it became this thing that people that with this national intention. So what was going on that created that? First of all, there was this new form of transportation called air airplanes. So that reporters from Washington, D.C. and from New York could fly up here in an hour and a half and cover the campaign and fly home the same day if they wanted to. We were very accessible thanks to airplanes and thanks to our geography to the Washington and New York news media. Second of all, we're kind of a corny little state. Some people, you know, they could come up here and you know they you got you could have to use an outhouse if I go to the bathroom. You know, there was this kind of mythology about it, which played in to what America was all about at that moment in time, because 1952 was the height of the McCarthy era, was the height of the Cold War. And New Hampshire was in so many ways an advertisement for what America is all about. We were the place where people were sitting around in the, the country store, sitting around the pot belly stove, playing checkers and talking presidential politics because they were about to decide who was going to be president. This was what America was. And so to broadcast this out to the world was a statement about why we're the better system than communism. And, and, and that caught on. That was, so that added to the, to the media hype that went into the New Hampshire primary. Those two factors, our accessibility and our, you saw the cover, it wasn't a candidate, it was a farmer, a farmer. Where else in the world do the farmers decide who the leader of the free world is? So what I'm going to show you next is a newsreel of the 1952 primary, universal newsreel. And think about those themes that I just said, that this is what America is all about. This is the newsreel that was sent out after the primary. <laughs> Primary 
elections in New Hampshire for delegates to the Democratic and Republican National Conventions find candidates and campaign managers pulling no punches. Everyone is in there pitching in an endeavor to gauge the mood of the American people. This is the first real popularity test for the favorites, and Senator Robert A. Taft comes to New Hampshire to make his bid. Sasson hopes for another opportunity to corral the Republican nomination. The citizens of the Granite State are not easily won. The country meeting places are hotbeds of political discussion. In village, town, and city, voters brave bitter snow and sleet to cast their vote. One on the Democratic side, and Richard Nixon was given a write in vote for vice president, and that kept him on the ballot. And that's, uh, 1960 was the year that really the only two candidates that came here and campaigned were Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. Now, I guess I should throw out you all know who Bernie Booten was? How many people? So Bernie was very critical in there. Bernie was approached by the Kennedy people in 1956. If he wanted to help get John Kennedy elected president, they came, brought him down to Washington, D.C. He had a one-on-one -on -one with uh, Senator Kennedy at the time. Uh, and he said, from that moment on, I'd follow him anywhere. Um, and so Bernie came back. He ran for governor of New Hampshire in 1958 as a way of helping take control of the Democratic Party for the Kennedy campaign. So by the time the 1960 came along, and he ran again for governor in 1960, Bernie was in control of the Kennedy faction, oh, not I wouldn't say, oh, I'm being a little too strong here, but was very strongly influencing the New Hampshire presidential uh, Democratic Party. And so in 1960, the Democratic Party in New Hampshire was as strong as it had ever been in many years. It started with Keith Offer saying, yeah, you Democrats, you know, Democrats can win if you work at it. And then Bernie came in and then um, um, Kennedy came in to help build the party. Or, no, it's okay. Um, so in the next section we're going to show, you'll see a, a clip of Bernie. And I'd like to share Bernie, uh, uh, you know, Bernie ultimately went to work with the Kennedy the day after Kennedy was elected. He got a call from the president-elect saying, come on down, I want you to work with me here. And Bernie was the um, uh, administrator for the General Services Administration. Um, I, when I did the interview with Bernie, you know, over his, you don't see it in the picture, but over his right shoulder was a mantle and a large place in the mantle. And over the mantle was an engraving about this big of the White House. And it had written down in the corner to Bernie, who stood by the president from the very beginning to the very end, and was signed by Jack Wood, December 1963. That was how close Bernie was to the Kennedy family. Anyway, Jacqueline Kennedy. Yeah. Yeah, Jacqueline Kennedy. Less than a month after her husband killed, she sent that out to people who couldn't burn. Um, right here, right here in the Lakes region. Wonder what happened to that when Bernie died a few years ago. Anyway, so we're going to jump up to the 1968 presidential primary. And again, we're going to look at the Democratic side, not because I'm Democrat or Republican, but just because those races were a little more interesting in these years. Um, 1968, what is the issue for the United States? Y'all lived through it. Y'all know it. The war in Vietnam. 
And that was what defined what this primary, but, and so in 1968, people started looking at New Hampshire as a way to make a statement, just like, just like Estes Kefauver didn't try to make a statement, but did in 1952, they started to use the, they saw the primary as a place to make a statement about the war in Vietnam. And they got Gene McCarthy to come up here and run as a candidate for president. So we're gonna look at that campaign. Um, and I should say that the, the clips from Bernie in here reflect on how Bernie felt about having built the party. You know, he had built this party up from the 1950s and now it's 1968 and there's this huge divide and you'll hear some of his kind of reflections on how that played out. So here's the 1968 Democratic primary. You almost knew it was futile that the statement had to be made about the war. I think for many, many people it was not the man who wants to be president, but an issue that people are increasingly concerned about. And he's the one who brought it before us. And there, like, there were some of the votes for people who felt that the war hadn't been pursued strongly enough or successfully enough. So it was anti Johnson in that respect. Uh, not exactly peace people, but who felt like the war was a failure. And there were some who thought he was Joe McCarthy. In 68, it, it was very evident to me that one of the things we needed was to revitalize the party. You could see ragged edges all over the place. Ten years earlier, Bernie Booten had led a new generation of Democrats to control of the state party. Now another generation was about to challenge the status quo and the presidential administration that had brought Democrats to power in the state. So it really was my suggestion to have Senator McIntyre and Governor King as co-chairman of the campaign. They were good friends to begin with. Our top office holders in New Hampshire. And uh, hopefully this would provide a unifying base. So instead of two teams, maybe there'd be one team. First of all, we were told that we were committing treason by the senator, our Democratic senator, and the governor, Democratic governor. And people in the, in the state committee, in the state committee, mm -hmm. that uh, it was, I mean, to the point of treason. Mm. And uh, that we would have no political futures whatsoever. If we had any political ambitions, forget about it. We were committing political suicide. Well, there's a difference between Washington and New Hampshire. And yet, if John King said something, you had to stick by what he said. And that's what got you in trouble, whether you admit it or not. He accused McCarthy of lack of patriotism. And when they asked me this out of the call, I didn't know what the King had said. But I remember saying, oh, I, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that for, regardless of McCarthy and what he's saying, that he isn't still a patriot in, in every sense of the word. And that got us in trouble immediately because the next, next morning I was down in Hampton somewhere, or down in Hampton Beach or something. And we got a call from the gang saying, hey, King's up in arms. You contradicted him. And I think that that's where I kind of mushed out a little bit. I tried to squeal off it. And it was, a, it was a very difficult thing to, uh, to get involved in the last stages of that campaign as far as uh, knocking McCarthy around. It wasn't working. In fact, McCarthy had no competition, for Lyndon Johnson's name wasn't on the ballot. His was a write-in campaign. But both sides were aggressively out to win. The Johnson people blanketed the state with numbered pledge cards for people to sign, while the McCarthy people used radio advertising movie stars, and busloads of out-of-state college students. Keep clean with Jane. Yes. Yeah. We were a little nervous about the kids who were, the hair was too long or a little too rough looking. So they were putting sellers on telephones. They were not writing envelopes and uh, postcards and doing that kind of thing. They, there was a screening process. They weren't allowed to go out and look. Um, knock on doors unless they were reasonably shaved and hair cut and saved up a little. Whatever they did, they all worked so hard. And I think the thing they were so valuable for was the door-to-door -door campaign that they did. They went into every possible neighborhood that they could. By 1968, personal campaigning in New Hampshire was no longer a novelty. It was expected. While Johnson ignored the state, McCarthy made sure the voters of New Hampshire had a chance to meet him. He was more articulate and, and uh, intelligent 
uh, than many a politician that I've ever seen. And that appealed to some of us. Uh, to others, that, that was a turn off. However, he was a very, very gracious, friendly man. And I think anybody that he met personally was charmed by him. And don't you? Oh, yeah. I think oh, that, and the fact that he bothered, as I, as I said earlier, to go into funny little places to meet people. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was the actual winner, receiving 49% of the vote. However, McCarthy, who was only supposed to get 10%, ended up with 41% and a decisive moral victory. So in many ways, it was a repeat of 1952 because two weeks later, Johnson took himself out of the running. Now, most people think he wasn't going to run again anyways, but he'd lost that ability to kind of say, I'm not going to run. It was forever attached to it was because he got beat by uh, McCarthy here in the presidential primary. Um, any questions? So 68 is a pivotal year for the New Hampshire presidential primary because people began to look at it and say, what are these people up in New Hampshire all about? We're supposed to let Gene, we're supposed to let Lyndon Johnson president. They made this thing, they've embarrassed the president, and they, you know, what's going on here? So people started questioning the idea of this New Hampshire. But before, but, but more than questioning, people started realizing the value of the free media you get, the attention you get by winning the primary. And up until that moment, you know, the primary has been pretty clear. There was no real race in 56. In, in, in 60, it was clear that, yes, there were other candidates, but nobody was going to come to New England and challenge um, uh, John Kennedy, and nobody was going to come here because Nixon had a pretty strong base of support here in New Hampshire already. So nobody, so there was no challenge then. In 64, it was just after President Kennedy was killed, and so the primary really didn't have any impact that year. Um, and in fact, on the Republican side, it was a Republican uh, uh, write-in candidate. And on the Democratic side, there wasn't even a primary. Lyndon Johnson is the only president in the, in the latter half of the 20th century to never have his name on the ballot for the New Hampshire primary. As you heard, he said he didn't have it on there in 68, and he wasn't on the ballot in 64. So that started this new dynamic. That one, it became valuable to people that saw, yeah, I can use this. I can play this game out. And it also started raising questions about who is this primary all about. So that takes us to the 1972, sorry, again, primary. So um, there were quite a few people running for president on the Democratic side. As you know, Richard Nixon was still president in 72. Watergate was when it was discovered, but it wasn't when it took its full effect. Uh, and so Nixon was pretty, it was going to be a tough, tough run to beat Nixon. Um, so the two primary candidates out there were, anybody want to guess? Ed Muskie and George McGovern. You got it. Ed Muskie and George McGovern. Um, and clearly, Muskie saw himself as the heir apparent, and so did the Democratic Party establishment. Muskie was going to be the one. McGovern, at the beginning of 1971, really wasn't a lip. But in 1971, McGovern started making regular trips to New Hampshire. Now, it's the other thing. Why is Muskie? What happened with Muskie that makes him that particular crime was so memorable. He was crying. How many people thought he cried? Who says he cried? Who says he didn't? But the Manchester Union cried for the day. No way. All right. So here's the story of that incident. And here's the story of Compress of the 72 primary. And I should mention also for this little clip that I also did a few, uh, 20 years ago now, a documentary about the life of a biography of William Lowe. And so there's actually, this section here is a combination of clips from both the presidential primary documentary and the William Lowe documentary. So there's a, a different narrator there. Anyway, here we go. 1972, it's a bumpy ride. The union leader, whether you agreed with us, you hated us, we were, the, we were a conscience of the state. We still, we still were there to say, Aha, uh -huh, this guy is a thief, this guy is stealing, take a look at this, take a look at that. You know, there aren't a lot of newspapers that have the guts to go out and crusade. The Manchester Union Leader is New Hampshire's largest and only statewide daily newspaper, a potent force in itself. But it was made all the more powerful by its outspoken conservative publisher, William Loeb. Bill Loeb 
loved politics. He loved politics as the game of politics. He grew up with politics. Uh, he loved the give and take. He loved the power of politics. They, they provided a lot of the anti musket ammunition, no question about it, no question about it. They just hammered at it every day, every day. Politically, we're at the other end of the spectrum yeah, because, we're, because we were out of what was the liberal mainstream. It didn't mean that we were bad, it didn't mean that we were evil, it didn't mean that we did one thing different than any other newspaper, any television channel. We just went, we were just looking at it from a different, from a from a different side of the spectrum. We were looking at it from the right. Everyone else was looking at it from the left. In those days it was it was very bad to be a hippie. Uh, and uh, they would go and photograph hippies in front of the Muskie campaign. You know, they, well I don't know whether it was put up or not. You know, you don't you don't know. But but they really did everything they could. I never wrote a word that wasn't true. I never misquoted anyone. Loeb doesn't like Muskie, and Loeb has been told that Muskie has a short fuse. And uh, Loeb is going to see if he can light this fuse. Anti-Muskie editorials in the Union Leader were routine. But in February 1972, the Union Leader printed a letter suggesting that Muskie had used the term Canuck to refer to people of French-Canadian heritage. In Loeb's defense, Lowe ran every letter he got, unless it was clearly libelous. And Lowe got a lot of political letters on any subject. And I think part of Lowe's mindset was, wow, this is great. This is great stuff to get musky with. When issues uh, approached, uh, we wrote up Sam Juan Hill. We didn't just sit around and do nothing about it. And uh, one of his papers, uh, comments will always be, we can be anything, but I'll be damned if we're going to be tall. The letter was followed the next day by an editorial page reprint of an article from Newsweek magazine in which Muskie's wife Jane revealed a more laid back personality. Ed Muskie's fuse had been lit. On a snowy Saturday morning, 10 days before the primary, he held a rally in front of the union leader office. By attacking me, by attacking my life, he's proved himself to be a gutless coward. I think he lost it. I don't know whether he actually cried, but he obviously got overcome with emotion. Now, why didn't he go to Newsweek in New York and pull his flatbed truck up and have Osborne Elliott come down, you gutless coward, stop picking on my wife. I wasn't going to get him any votes in New Hampshire. He thought he was going to uh, do something to spark his campaign. Instead, it blew up in his face. I called William Lowe. He said, what do you think of this guy? He says, geez, a guy like that gets emotional over a little old newspaper publisher? I don't want a guy like that with his finger on a nuclear button. Oh, yeah. Every time it comes up to this day, when people uh, hear that I worked on the Muskie campaign, the first thing they say is, oh, too bad he cried. He was a good man. Too bad he cried. I had this. I mean, you know, I had that just the other day. Somebody said that. People still say that. <laughs> It really wasn't why I lost. Your campaign, from an organizer's point of view, can be perfection, but it doesn't move unless the candidate transmits a jolt of electricity to it. Because then people would come during the campaign, I can't tell you how many times. Oh, he's not like he was on the TV. And they were comparing the thrill they got, you know, from, from seeing him on the tube, cutting Nixon down to size and remembering how excited and thrilled they were. And it, and, uh, it didn't measure up. You know, they were disappointed. He went to shake hands at the polls. And he went up to this one young woman standing, I think it was Ward 6 in Manchester, as I remember. And he said, my name is George McGovern. And she said, this is the sixth time I've met you. His wife wouldn't let us schedule him as much as we wanted to. Jane Muskie took care of him. She took care of that man. He had to have a nap, you know, in the middle of the afternoon. And, and uh, the, uh, you know, the other candidates were going 24 hours a day with Ed was, was uh, having his rest. The New Hampshire primary demonstrated a new phenomenon in 1968. By being an election, the candidate could win by perception rather than actual votes. Perception would also play a role in 1972. 
Simply receiving the most votes would not be enough for Ed Muskie to be declared the winner. What Muskie was running against was not an arbitrary percentage, but an expectation that as the front runner from a neighboring state, he would do very well here. And if Muskie had run a good campaign here and had fallen a few percentage points short of 50%, I don't think anything much would be, have been made of it. Ed Muskie won New Hampshire. The fact that he got less than 50%, that perception, he, they should have never allowed the perception to go out across the country that he lost. When Muskie got up to speak that evening, he did not give, he did not accept the mantle of victory the way he should have because they had preconditioned themselves along the lines that they were going to get this unusually high percentage of the vote. Because he got, what did he wind up with, 49.6 or something like that? You know, he won. So much of it is the perception of. In the final count, George McGovern received 35% of the vote to Ed Muskie's 45%. McGovern, who had built his campaign on doing well in New Hampshire, never lost the momentum and went on to be the Democratic nominee in 1972. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so in many ways, 72, you know, it's all building on the lessons before, you know, McCarthy and his people looked at Estes Kefauver and they started building on that and made it more. They brought the attitude, they brought in college students, they brought in movie stars. And then the government did the same thing. He's looking at McCarthy and said, yeah, you know, if you spend some time here, you bring in out-of-state college students to campaign for you, you bring in some movie stars, you can, you can do it. And it was so critical to him. And it's, it's, it's now so much part of what the establishment, what you expect is part of the primary, you know? So, so in terms of how you run a campaign, I always looked at 868 and 72 as political primary 101. You know, if I hate to use those terms, but there it is, you know? Those are the ones that have the, the lessons you need to learn if you want to run a campaign. Now, something else happened after 72, and that was now people are really saying, who are these people in New Hampshire and why do they get so much publicity? I want to be a part of that. And so it was after the 72 primary that other states started saying, I think we want a primary and we want to be first. Um, Iowa said, I think we'll have a caucus. Let's do a caucus. We'll get them up here and we'll do a caucus. Florida was going to have its primary the week before. You know what happened? New Hampshire changed the date of town meeting. For the first time in its history, town meeting was not the second Tuesday in March, it was the first Tuesday in March. So they could jump over Florida trying to be the first in the presidential primary. Now, the next clip, we're going to jump to 1980. So between 72 and 80, there were some changes that happened in the primary that are important to know. So one of them is that now other states are starting to say, well, we want a, we want a piece of that. And who are you to, to, to to disrupt our front runner. You know, Ed Muskie was supposed to be elected, not, G not, not, not George McGovern. And so the political party establishment started saying, and, and so other, and other states wanted to get into it. And I forget the exact number, it was like seven or eight states created presidential primaries after 1972. In 76, it got even more contested because now they're gonna have a New England primary. And New Hampshire passed a law, thanks to Jim, uh, uh, James Splain, that New Hampshire's primary be one week earlier than any other primary in New England. Well, then other states started crowding in, saying, we're going to do it too. And they changed the law so that New Hampshire primary will be, by law, one week earlier than any other state in the country. And that's when we became the designated, don't try to beat us, first in the state. First in the nation primary. It's also the time when Bill Gardner became Secretary of State. And finally, after the 76 primary, they decided to take the names of delegates off the ballot. Because in the 1976 primary, there were over 300 names on the ballot because you had the delegates for each one of those candidates. And now we changed so that the candidate was in 72 or 76, I'm sorry, I don't remember which, that when we finally switched and tied the vote tally to the number of delegates. Not in 68. 68, actually, McCarthy has a majority of delegates. His people won the delegate count. 
even though uh, even though Johnson won the primary. Um, but by 72, that had been changed. Now delegates were delegated based on the percentage of the vote that you got. So now we're going to move to 1980, a Republican primary, even though we had Ted Kennedy thinking he was going to be uh, Jimmy Carter. So what is the defining moment of the 1980 New Hampshire presidential primary on the Republican side? Who's got a memory that can remember this? What was the question? What was the defining moment of the 1980 New Hampshire presidential primary on the Republican side? Reagan grabbing the microphone. You got it. <laughs> Anybody recognize the term? I paid for this microphone. All right. So this next clip is the story about how Ronald Reagan came to pay for that microphone. Uh, at that point, there were only two candidates in the red race. It was George Bush and, and, and uh, President Reagan. So that what you really wanted to have, uh, uh, and what uh, the National Telegraph saw, and so did I, by the way, and, and so did I, that, that uh, the way to clear the air was to have a one-on-one. -on -one. Petition was filed with the Federal Elections Commission, and it was found by the FEC that if we were to do that, it would constitute a campaign contribution to those two candidates. By the National Telegraph. Yeah. Uh, National Telegraph being a corporation, it would be an illegal campaign contribution. So we called up the, uh, the Bush people and told them, look, uh, uh, we want the debate. Uh, uh, we think it ought to go forward. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we split half of it? Why don't we split it and put it on? We'll each pay half. And uh, the answer back for them was that uh, uh, they didn't want to split it. They didn't want to pay for it. Because the challenge had come from the Reagan people. And I think it was just a little gamesmanship, I suppose. You, know, you pay for it, you challenge us. So we decided, I, I happened to be fortunate at the time, I had uh, Angela Buchanan, who was the treasurer for the campaign, who had come into town for the election. The election was going to be now the following Tuesday, I guess. And uh, she was sitting there, and I said, uh, Betty, uh, let's go for it. And she said, and she was all far. And uh, we wrote the check, and uh, the debate went on. During the day, I remember talking with John Green at the Telegraph and saying, John, I want to know whether or not the other candidates are going to be participating or not participating. And he said, the understanding is clear. There are going to be no other candidates, just the president, uh, just Ronald Reagan and George Bush. I said, fine, we're willing to play by any rules that are agreed to, but we want to know what they are. And if that's the way it's going to be, that's the way it's going to be. But the question of who was going to be in the debate and who wasn't, became so fluid over that weekend, uh, I don't think anybody quite knew. That at one point, the decision was trying to be made whether uh, if the rest couldn't go on, whether one or Reagan would go on. It was perceived as uh, the Bush people just standing back and saying nothing. It wasn't really true. Uh, they, they were willing to concede opening it up to all the other candidates. Uh, it was a telegraph's decision not to open it up. In the, middle of this, in the middle of discussions where I was still trying to negotiate to get everybody on the start stadium on, on the stage and was still and was still trying to negotiate to open it up to all the candidates. But George Bush marches up in through the door up to the stage and sits there alone. Now that's my memory, and, and there's this sort of a pause and, and, and people are wondering, I think, and, and uh, and no one quite knows what's going to happen next. Is Ronald Reagan going to go up on that stage or not? Are the other candidates going to go up on that stage or not? To have all seven of them there at once was, I think, uh, not poisonous. When did you uh, know or finally accept the fact that all seven were going to come on that stage? When they walked past me, onto the stage. The first I knew that they were going to be on the stage was when I, I saw them coming up on the stage. Uh, someone asked, someone did ask me if chairs are going to be provided, and I said no. President Reagan wanted to make an, an opening statement. It was, the statement was not provided for in the format. With the sound man, please turn Mr. Reagan's mic off for a minute. Is this on? Yeah. Mr. Green, you turn on the microphone. You for me and you. I am paying for this microphone now.
Just a little bit of one minute, uh, uh, New Hampshire, with, without this debate. And we would have won it, I think, by a decent margin, but not a big margin. So that George Bush would have still done very well in New Hampshire. The national debate was really national in its impact more than even New Hampshire. It took that great in victory in New Hampshire and just made it, made it a tremendous national impact. That's the significance of the debate, much more so than its impact on New Hampshire. It, it just demolished the, the Bush campaign. So that's the story of how he came to pay for this microphone. It's funny, I think that if you look at the overall history of the primary, there's probably two of the most defining moments of the primary were this one and Must Be Pride. We haven't had one really strong moment like that come out since then that I'm aware of. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm the only one. Um, so I don't know, if you watch that, what was your sense? Did Jerry, I always am intrigued by the fact that Jerry Carmen, he was always saying, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know what it's going to be. Jeb Gray, well, we're very clear. It's just going to be just for the two of us. You know, those are the rules. The rules are just the two of us. And Jerry Carmen, ah, no, you know, you know, the fact is that the Reagan people invited all the other candidates to come down. They were basically put in there for props. And it wasn't really, you know, what's, what's that mean? I paid for this microphone. It's a meaningless statement in so many ways. But what it was, was Reagan taking control in a way that just, you know, very presidential. And on the other side, George Bush, I don't know if you noticed, he's just sitting there, you know, what is going on? How did this happen to me? And, you know, he was a wimp. And, and, and that was the dynamic that shifted. Now, the Reagan people really would have won the primary. Otherwise, they had a solid ground game and they had everybody going here. But this just amplified that win and, and just, it, it ended the Bush campaign and made Ronald Reagan president in so many ways. Um, it's funny, I was thinking about this the other night when we were watching that debate of the current debate. I kept thinking, turn that microphone off. <laughs> I was wishing there was someone to say, will you turn that microphone off? Um, if you know politics a little bit or if you know public events in New Hampshire, maybe you've been to an event where the sound system was provided by Bob Malloy Sound. Malloy Sound, big red letters, the red truck, Malloy Sound down, sound and video. Bob Malloy was the sound man. And actually those microphones, he still owns. But the, the Reagan Library asked if they could have them on display at the Reagan Library out in California, and that's where they are. The microphones that, that Ryan could pay for. Um, as in another aside, there's a great movie, Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn, called State of the Union made back in the early 1950s. And it's about a guy, Spencer Tracy, who wants to run for president. And he starts getting corrupted. He's a good guy. But there's these evil forces that are kind of, you know, well, if you want to do that, then you've got to, you've got to toe the line here, you know? And so the, the movie is about this conflict as it becomes stronger and stronger, the force is saying that he's got to compromise what he believes in. And, and Catherine Hepburn and his wife. And they're going to have a big press conference or a big statement, not so much a press conference, he's going to read a statement at his house about what he's going to do. And so the national networks are there and, and, and so on. And he goes out and somebody tries to holler to shut it down. And he goes, I'm paying for this microphone because he has set it up. Now, some people will say that that's where Ronald Reagan got the line from State of the Union, but I doubt that it was. Anyway, that's my story. So, um, you've gone a little over an hour, and uh, I have one more clip if you want to see it. No, sure, sure, you want to go home? Go home, I'll go home. Um, all right, last clip. So, um, we're going to jump ahead to 19, I'm sorry, to, yeah, 1992. Um, but what happens in the intervening years? 84, remember the Democratic primary of 84? Again, we had, a designated front runner, Walter Mondale. He was going to be, he was the heir apparent to the presidential uh, nomination for the Democrats in 1984 until a guy named Gary Hart beat the pants off of him in the presidential primary out of nowhere. And, there, and there, so there was another example of New Hampshire putting on some young whippersnapper that disrupts the party, party nomination, you know? And so again, these eyes, and it was commissioned, we're going to take this thing away from New Hampshire, we're going to create a window, we're going to do all this. But with the law on the books and a guy named Bill Gardner as, as Secretary of State, New Hampshire fought and has fought several primaries afterwards, always winning. In fact, at one point we were out of the window. And that's how we, you know, in, in 2008, the primary was 
was basically the second week in January, um, just to always stay ahead. For a while, uh, Delaware was going to have a, a primary on the same day as New Hampshire. They thought, well, just have the same day, we'll be all right. The candidates came to New Hampshire, and the first thing they were asked was, are you going to campaign in Delaware? So pretty soon, all the candidates had signed it and had signed a, a letter saying they would not vote in Delaware. So Delaware had set up a, a primary campaign with no, nobody wanted to run in it. Um, and that became a little complicated for them. So they changed it and said they could put the names on the ballot even without the candidates asking. And still, it was a very lackluster event. But now we jump to 1992. And again, this is the Democratic primary. And uh, 1992, George Bush is president. And in the very beginning, he looked like a pretty strong candidate. Nobody thought he was going to be beat. Uh, but there was still a little action. The first one to jump in was um, Paul Sangas from down in Massachusetts, and he made some other candidates. So this is the story of 1992. Now, one of the reasons I like to show this is, is because of the connection. You see all these elements build, and they come to the, you know, the, the, the attention uh, and the work and the delegates. You know, think about that, that motion, that, that comment back there in the 72 campaign, when Ed Muskie is taking naps in the afternoon, and, and, and George McGovern is out there shaking hands so much that people say, he shook my hand six times already. You know, that's the candidate that you need, and you see that kind of energy here. But more importantly, is the lesson that he got from, from uh, uh, Joe Gremmings up. You know, it's about perception. It's all about perception. Plays a new role here, too. All right, 1992. The, fun the first there. presidential aspirant to step forward was former United States Senator Paul Songus of Massachusetts. He announced his candidacy in April 1991. Though Songus would be the only announced Democratic candidate for the next five months, his campaign struggled to be taken seriously. He had had cancer. Um, he was a Greek from Massachusetts four years after Michael Dukakis was defeated. In light of all that, to be taken seriously, there was no question that we would have to win in New Hampshire at the very least. But it's been the constant companion of the economic policies of this administration. It was Governor Bill Clinton who truly began to emerge as the Democrat to be in the primary. He had a message that people wanted to hear, but there was something more something only a voter who shakes your hand and looks you in the eye can understand. What Bill Clinton has is an incredible warmth. And he looks at you and he focuses on you and he responds to your question. You believed that he believed in you. He knew your problems. He knew the frustrations, the anger that you dealt with on a daily basis. Clinton also campaigned with a fervor and energy that was nonstop. He and wife Hillary would spend over 40 days meeting the voters of New Hampshire, talking and listening. Brown, Kerry, all of them are out the side door into their cars, gone. Governor Clinton gets down from the from the state, from the head table, and wanders around that room in the Bedford uh, Village Inn until he has talked to every single person that's still there. But remember, I was talking to a man I had loved for 12 years. On January 23rd, a former Arkansas State employee accused Bill Clinton of having an affair with her several years earlier. In 1988, a similar charge had taken Gary Hart out of the race. But this was a different year and a different candidate. Tell you the story that she told the person who offered the money. It wasn't true. The person who offered the money said, who cares whether it's true or not? You have to do a say it. And he'll be subject to just what you see here today. The Clintons fought back of the issue head on, challenging the credibility of the charge. They appeared together on 60 Minutes to talk about it. Got up the next morning and a friend of mine called and they said, you know, if, if, if he's a friend, this is when he needs help. And the, the, the truth of that statement just uh, struck me to the bone. Call the guy at the ROTC department, Kansas University. And he'll tell you that I was a troubled young man, probably from his point of view, who opposed the Vietnam War, but I did not do anything wrong. Just and when the campaign was getting back on track, Clinton found himself again on the defensive. This time, it was a letter he had written during the Vietnam War. Clinton's numbers began to fall. What we want to know is, as the president, how are you going to handle this problem? How are you going to handle this 
With just 10 days to go before the primary, New Hampshire voters were growing weary of news coverage not focused on issues. While the Songus campaign continued to gain strength and positive attention, Bill Clinton watched his lead disappear. But rather than give up, Clinton looked to his New Hampshire supporters for advice. And he had a meeting in a small room at the headquarters with just us. And he said, this isn't going well. So we're, we're, um, we're not doing well. You people know the state much better than I do. What do you think I should do? And I asked him, I said, do you believe that notwithstanding everything that's come out, that you should be the president of the United States? And he paused. He said, I do. I said, then that's the message. Don't let all this other gibberish come into it. I just want to do as much as that person, the person who can't find up here. While the Clinton campaign got itself back on track and shifted into high gear, the Songus campaign was forced to shift down. The candidate contracted a case of conjunctivitis. And the last thing you needed to do was to look very unhealthy um, with conjunctivitis, you do. And he was basically out of the, off the campaign trail for most of the day, each of those last days of the New Hampshire primary. At the few campaign stops Songus did make, he wore glasses to hide the redness of his eyes. Meanwhile, Bill Clinton was doing everything he could to revive his campaign, still looking for votes late into the night on the eve of the primary. Hillary was exhausted. She came to John Barry and said, I'm exhausted. I'm going to bed. Do something. He wouldn't stop. I mean, late at night, you went to a bullet gallery with campaigning and uh, stopping at another Dunkin' Donut, and he was just relentless. On election night, the networks began their coverage of the primary at 9 p.m. The Clinton campaign knew Paul Saunders was going to win the most votes, but still up for grabs was who would be the score at the night. You have to go on at five past the hour while they're still introducing it, and take the lead of the night. And the way you do that is declare victory. So what do you mean? And you get up at five past eight or nine, you introduce Clinton before the mob scene of supporters, and he comes out and says, he won, which leaves your opposition the option of claiming defeat. I mean, there's, <laughs> Let them play off of what you've already said. Well, the evening is young. And we don't know yet what the final tally will be. I think we know enough to say with some certainty that New Hampshire tonight has made Bill Clinton the comeback kid. It was Paul Saunders who won the primary with an eight-point margin over Bill Clinton. Clinton would be the one who gave the best victory speech. He would use his New Hampshire momentum to go on and win the Democratic nomination for president. Separated by 20 years, but the same advice. I just find that fascinating. Um, any questions, comments, thoughts? Put me on the spot. See if I'm <laughs> How much longer are we going to be in the first primary? You know, Nobody really knows that. And I think that it's not going to be a state taking it away from us. I think the technology will change the reality of what happens in presidential primaries before. It'll never happen as long as Bill Gardner is Secretary of State, and he may not he may choose to step down this year. I don't know. But, you know, we've got the law, and we've got people, and we've got a commitment. And, you know, there's also the other side that the media has made an investment. They know how to work the state. They know who the players are. And everybody knows David, knew David Broder, or, you know, James Ruskin, you know. So that they understand the state. And for them to start, and so they support it in a subtle way. They like this idea of potential. But I don't, I think that what will ultimately happen is there'll just be some technology that comes along that makes it less of a less of an issue. That's my opinion. I do history. I'm not a prognostic here. I just tell you what happened, not what's going to happen. So, uh, any other questions? So, I'll just share as a, as a final story. Um, again, this idea that New Hampshire was such resentment in some parties about us, even with Bill Clinton, that was so addictive. I mean, it's not there now, but up until really 2000, I think you would find pockets of resistance about New 
equal to negative two plus negative one. So in 84, um, as I alluded to a little earlier, uh, uh, Mondale was supposed to be the heir apparent and, and Gary Hart really upset the part, although Mondale ultimately was the nominee. Um, it disrupted the flow. And it just so happened at that point in time, after shortly after the primary, I was set up to go down and do a series of programs. We did a series of documentaries about our congressional delegation down in Washington. And this had all been booked, and I thought, well, you know, maybe we could also do a story about what are they saying in New Hampshire or in Washington about New Hampshire. Do another show just to really, you know, didn't take that much extra time to do the interview. So we started booking interviews with people, and and um, I thought it might be interesting to get an interview with with Tip O'Neill, who at the time, as you remember, was Speaker of the House. So I started calling his office, and his press secretary was this guy named Chris Matthews who ultimately was the host of the show on MSNBC. Um, and Chris, you know, we started going back and forth and, and he was sympathetic. Um, and, and finally I got down to DC and, and kept calling and he said, all right, well, tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, the speaker's gonna pull into the document store at the Capitol building. He'll be ready for you, take the question. The document store is a little door on the ground floor between the main steps to the Capitol Rotunda and the house steps, right down here. We were there, eight o'clock, earlier than eight o'clock, waiting, and sure enough, this big limousine pulls up, and 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 we go around. At that point in time, I had a cameraman, and he had a, a camera and a deck. It wasn't a camcorder; it was a two-thing unit. And we followed it around, and and the door opens up, and this literally a waft of cigar smoke just came out and hit me. Uh, and the next thing is Chip O'Neill steps out and reaches out. I reach out and we shake hands and, and I look at him and I said, well, Mr. Speaker, we wanted to ask you a couple questions about the New Hampshire primary. And he looked right at me and he said, New Hampshire? I've got nothing to say about that. And he literally threw my hand down and went into the document store. That's how people in Washington established themselves about New Hampshire after the 84 primary. Anyway, that's my final story. Thank you so much for coming. We had you know, a small, uh, intimate audience, um, but I, you know, you've reminded me it's been seven months since I've given this talk. I love talking about it. Funny, there's lots of stories here and lots of things I didn't share that I could. Anyway, I hope folks, I didn't share. <laughs>